welcome in Jesus' name. Turn to someone, say welcome in Jesus' name. Come on, say it enthusiastically. Well, this is Understanding the Times. My name's Mark Henry, and we're glad that you're here tonight. And let's welcome Jan Markell. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Jan and I tonight have a number of things we want to share with you. We'll be doing that here in just a moment. But let me just uh, tonight start by throwing out a special uh, welcome to the underground church. You know, all across America right now, there's Bible study groups that are popping up and just saying, we're going to follow Jesus. We're going to read the scriptures again. We're going to gather and do what Acts 2.42 says, that they gathered together in Jesus' name. They stuck with the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking the bread and prayer. So special shout out to all of you. Uh, the streaming parties that are happening all across uh, the, the country and quite honestly around the world. Uh, I was different ones reaching out to me this week from Idaho and Western Colorado and, and other parts. And so welcome. And our friends literally from around the world, our last gathering, 73 countries that we know of participated with us. And we're anticipating uh, the Lord granting us more in the days ahead. If you think about it, there's roughly 190 countries. Not all of them speak English, right? <laughs> and so 73 countries participated in our last gathering, and we're looking forward to that. Well, tonight, Jan and I are going to be sharing a number of difficult things. Michelle's going to be sharing a number of difficult things. And I want to give you a verse to hold on to, all right? And you're going to hear me repeat this verse throughout the night. Because as Jan and I talk about these, these things that are happening uh, and how they relate to Scripture, God's not shocked. God's not shocked. You and I shouldn't be shocked. But God gives us promises to hold on to. The verse I want you to remember tonight is this. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. We'll look at it at the very end tonight together. But it says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. How many evil deeds? Every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And you know, if you don't hold on to God's promises, friends, you will lose your mind. And if you haven't trusted Christ, tonight's the night. Go back to the promises of God. He'll sustain you. Probably many of you on the way here tonight, or maybe you're watching from some other part of the world, you've heard about the shooting right here that's taking place. There's an active shooting, I guess, down at Mall of America. And so we just want to stop right here. Jan, you and I have talked about this. Lawlessness increases in the last days. Why? Because the value of humanity decreases. And we've seen this, uh, I mean, think about the anger we've seen over Roe versus Wade. Why? Because we have a low view of man being made in the image of God. Of course, there Amen. is no God. You don't have to worry about that. If, if there is no God, there is no morality, and on and on it goes. And so let's just pause right here. Let's pray, and then Jan's going to introduce our speaker. Lord, we humble ourselves in your presence, and we acknowledge that you are the God of heaven and earth. And in your grace, you provided the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have the, the bonds of Jesus knitting us together from countries around the world. And Lord, we love you for that. And Lord, we, uh, we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We confess he died for sins. We confess that he rose again the third day. We confess that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. And Lord, we confess tonight that he is coming. And Lord, we pray that you would give us grace to live in these days. And Lord, I pray for the situation unfolding right here in Minnesota, in Mall of America. Uh, Lord, that you would give a, a speedy end uh, to, to this situation, that people would be safe and that people would turn to you because theology matters and the theology of the world is bringing this evil upon us. So God, help us to look to you tonight. Give us grace. Give my friends grace. I pray it in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. I want to thank you for coming as well. And, you know, I have a saying that I just keep repeating all the time. And as Pastor Mark's talking about the situation at Mall of America, all I can keep thinking of and expressing, sadly, is we are trending towards the tribulation. It's just shouting at us that we're trending towards the tribulation, which of course means the church is going to vacate at any time. Here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to have sort of three part. If you've been here before, you know. Michelle's going to share briefly. She's got something on her heart, and so we want her to be able to share. And then we're going to have kind of a little discussion up here. 
and then we will be having a short Q&A as well. And I just want to say this, a couple things about Michelle. I've worked with her, I think, probably going on 20 years. She spoke, well, I've known her since, I think she was in college uh, some years ago. I met her before she married Marcus, so that's how long I've known Mar uh, Michelle. She's kind of the sister I never had. And she's been on air with me almost more than any other uh, radio guest, so I'm, I'm making this short up here so we don't take from her time. But currently... She's dean of the Robertson School of Government, Regent University. She's been in government almost since I've known her. Started in state government that served in the House of Representatives in, in Washington and then ran for, pre vice, for president of the United States in 2012 and left Congress in, uh, I believe, January of 2015. And she has said, I keep bugging her, when can I write your book? And that's because she's got stories you wouldn't believe. Jet setting and traveling. She got back from Israel this morning. So that's just the kind of lifestyle that she, she leads and she needs your prayers, really needs your prayers. So that's the three part program that we'll have tonight. Rather than taking any more time, Mark and I, I want to bring Michelle on out. Michelle, please come out. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. It's all yours. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank Michelle. you. God Michelle. bless you. Michelle, bless you. Just know, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Michelle or Jan or myself tonight, you can text them to us on the number that's up on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good, because I've got a lot to say. Thank you so much for coming. There's always a lot to say. And I want to also thank everyone who is joining us online tonight. I know that Jan's audiences are huge and growing all the time because the material that comes through Understanding the Times and through Pastor Mark Henry is the most relevant, truthful material you're going to hear in almost any venue today. People understand the Times and hopefully know what to do. So it's an exciting time to be here tonight. I'm thrilled to be here. And yes, I left to go to Israel on Saturday night, and I just got back late this morning. So I'm, I, I was excited about coming here and talking to you tonight. And what is on my heart is something that I've been thinking about for some time and, and an observation that I've been making. And it's this. In the midst of all of this lawlessness and in the midst of of the lies. We are drowning in lies nearly every day, and this is difficult. Think about when you grew up, when you were a little kid, and you would go out in the morning, and you wouldn't hear, your mom wouldn't hear from you. You'd just be playing all day, and she might say, time for lunch, and then you come home. And then you go back out again, maybe you go swimming, or you do whatever you're gonna do, horse around with your friends, and you'd hear, time for supper, you come back in. What an innocent time that we lived in. And little girls didn't even like little boys. And little boys didn't even like little girls. We just, you know, played the games that we played. We never once uh, thought that maybe a little girl was a little boy or a little boy was a little girl. I mean, this just didn't even happen. So when you think about even 10 years ago, even five years ago, and then you think about today, we hear this horrific news. Uh, when I was picked up today at 5 o'clock, I was told that at 4.30 the shooting happened in the Nike store at Mall of America. Nobody knew how many are shot or if anyone is dead, so we prayed right away. We don't know. But what we did is we turned to each other and we said, every day, every day, something insane happens every day. And it isn't that there's more communication. It's that there's more insanity every day. And why is that? I don't think it's hard to understand. It's because mankind is rejecting God more now than ever and embracing that which is false. We see more mocking, more scoffing, more of everything. But what we really see a lot of the, these days is propaganda. That's what we hear. 
I spent the last from Saturday on with the guy who was driving me around Israel was from Russia and he was an atheist. We talked about the Lord the whole time in the, in the back of the car, talked about the Lord the whole time, but it was an excellent conversation. And, uh, and he warmed, you know, as there was about four of us in the car and he warmed the whole time, but it was excellent because we talked about the former Soviet union and what the former Soviet union was like. And I had so many people in Israel say to me, what is going on in America? What is happening over there? We don't recognize what we read. Is it really as bad as it is? And so Boris, isn't that a great name? <laughs> Bo like, like Bullwinkle and Rocky, you know, as Boris and Natasha. <laughs> Natasha. And we were talking, and he was talking to me about propaganda and propaganda in the USSR. And I got to thinking, oh, no, no, we've got the freshest propaganda. And that's what we deal with literally every day here in the United States. We are dealing with propaganda, whether it is coming from government, whether the propaganda is coming from woke corporations, whether it's coming from the culture institutions like Hollywood, or whether it's coming from uh, major leagues, you name it, through, through banking industries. We are getting inundated with propaganda day after day after day. And when that happens, you can get numb. You can get immune. You kind of tune it out and figure, oh, I guess that that's the noise level I'm going to live with now. And you just keep going on because somehow the human mind says, I got to adapt. I've got to adapt to my situation. And I'm here tonight to tell you, do not adapt. Don't adapt to propaganda. Because propaganda is lies. Because you see, those who are pushing propaganda care about what they want. They don't care about what you want because you want something that's going to make your life better. Those who are pushing this propaganda want what they want. And so that's where we have to understand that we, our souls right now are living in anguish every day and it's exhausting. It's exhausting because we are swimming in a sea of lies. And I think about the scripture about righteous Lot. When righteous Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah, the scripture said that his soul was vexed. Vexed means angry. His soul was angry. Have you felt that in the last two years? In the last three years? That you feel like your soul is just angry? When am I going to wake up and this is over? If you ever remember that old soap opera at night, Dallas, and one season... They woke up and it was all a big dream and, you know, there was Bobby, you know, I mean, it was, <laughs> and I keep hoping that it'll be like an episode of Dallas and we'll wake up and we'll go back to normal. And Jan and I talk about this all the time. If you look according to scripture, I don't think that's going to happen because it's like we leapt into a completely different era and a completely different time. And so that's why it's important that we keep our heads about us and that we know who we are. We know whose we are. And it is more important than ever before in our lives. I think more important than any era in human history that we know the Lord, that we know his word and the power of his word and that we stay in the power of his word and we stay in relationship with him through prayer and that we do what the Bible says that we are to be the, like the 10 virgins with our oil, our oil lamps full and with the wicks lit because when we know that our Messiah is soon coming we got to be ready is it an option I guess so but if you're a believer Honestly, it is the most exciting time in history to be alive. Because we have a soon and coming king 
And we are living in the days that the prophets long to see. We are privileged to live now. Jan and I have talked about it. It, the greatest uh, uh, prophecy ever has been fulfilled in our lifetimes. And that is the rise of modern Israel in 1948. And that God has been bringing the Jews back just from Ukraine falling alone just in these last few months. 30,000 Jews have come into Israel from Ukraine. More are coming all the time. I met with incoming Jews who've, who've come in as refugees. And this is a unique nation, but it is filling biblical prophecy. Just like in 1967, when Jerusalem finally came back into Israel's hands, like Ezekiel foretold, that is 1,500 years of prophecy fulfilled in our lifetime. Is the Bible true? Are you kidding me? It's absolutely true. It is the truest thing out there. And so all the propaganda, all the lies, whatever the bureaucracy is telling us on any given day, let them go ahead and blow all the smoke they want to blow because we know what is true and what is happening. And quite often, and occasionally I'll call Jan and sometimes, you know, I'll just be feeling despair because you watch everything falling apart around you. But I have to say, I've been feeling more joy in my life than ever before because I'm excited. I'm anticipating the coming king. I'm anticipating what's around the corner. And something that is telling me that he is coming soon is, in, as I've been thinking about propaganda and why we've had so much propaganda that we've had to deal with, why we've had so much lies that we have to deal with, because propaganda begets persecution. And one thing that the scripture says is that at the very last days, that persecution will rise for God's people. Well, that can be frightening if you're God's people, the persecution. But one thing I started to see is that persecution is rising. We've had a good life. And I'm not talking in the Middle East. I'm talking here. Persecution is rising, but it's subtle. Satan never takes a stake and just slaps you in the face with it. It's subtle. And here's the subtlety. There's a terrible anger. It's a satanic anger that is out in America right now. And the anger is against the Bible believer. The anger is against the Bible believer who is not cold, is not lukewarm, but knows God, believes the Bible, and wants to apply the Bible, and wants to understand the Bible, and wants to take the truths of the Bible, not only to other people, but also to take it in the public sphere. I didn't even realize this. Someone brought it to my attention, that all of a sudden there's been all of these books that are written. I've got one here. It's called Taking America Back for God. Sounds like a great title. It isn't. This is the blueprint for a national smear campaign against Christians. And what they've done is they came up with a term. They invented a term, probably for most of the people in this audience. They mentioned my name in this book is one of them. And we are called Christian Nationalists like a white nationalist or like nas national socialists. So the pejorative, meaning negative term, accusatory term that they've given us is white nationalists. Or I'm sorry, that, well, that's what they mean, <laughs> uh, is Christian nationalists. They hate Christians. They hate Christians because we take the Bible seriously. We take what the Bible says seriously. We want to obey, and we want to see our nation grow and prosper. You know what they really hate? They really hate our heritage. They really hate the Christian foundation of America. They hate David Barton of Wall Builders Ministry. He's mentioned in here multiple times. They hate it when a church has a Freedom Sunday and there's an honoring of veterans. They think it's terrible when veterans stand up in a church and we honor veterans. They hate it on July 4th. If we talk about the, the primary source documents, the actual quotes from our founders that they look to holy God, 
There is no question. It isn't even, it isn't even debatable. The number one book that was referenced by the founders across the board when they're putting this nation together was the Bible. A distant second was the great French philosopher Montesquieu, then the English philosopher John Locke and others, but it was the Bible. In fact, you can take the Declaration of Independence apart and you can find scripture for almost every portion, the Constitution, scripture for almost every portion because these were some of the most brilliant geniuses ever assembled and they wanted to get it right. They weren't perfect, but they wanted to get it right and they sought the Lord and this is the document they came up with. The people who hate Christians in America now are trying to define us. They came up with the term Christian nationalists. They've defined Christian nationalists as someone who believes the Bible and believes what the scripture says, and, they, and, and this is the worst sin of all in their mind, they take the biblical principles and they want to take them into the voting booth. And they want to take those ideas and see it in American law at the federal, state, and local level. And nothing could be worse than that. And clearly we are racists. They call us that over and over and over. This is considered the Bible. This is quoted more often than any other book on that topic of white or of Christian nationalism. I want to bring this up to you because you're going to hear a lot about it. And let me tell you how this works. This is propaganda. That's what this is. It's not true. It's lies. I read this book. And it's underlined all over the place. I write in the margins and I just couldn't believe it. I wrote lies, false, not true, never happened all through this book. But it's propaganda because the church is being lied about because the whole intention is to make sure what? That we shut up. That's it. it, it th these people aren't too complicated because what they really hate more than anything in this book they're trying to talk about this whole concept that Christians just want raw political power. And when you're accused of that, the accuser is the one who is doing exactly what they're accusing us of doing. They want raw political power. You see, they want what they want. They hate democracy. Have you noticed that? In DC, they hate democracy. They love shoving whatever their idea is down our throat at any given time. But what they have to do is take the heel of their boot and rub it into our faces. And they're trying to create a scare campaign all across America that Christian nationalists are the domestic terrorists that are destroying this nation. I highly doubt that whoever is over at the Mall of America is a, so, is, is a Baptist who's on Bible study. I doubt that. And I don't mean to make fun of this situation that's going on. But this is how absurd this is. That's why I make that comparison, to show you the absurdity. They are serious when they are saying that it is the believer who is the domestic terrorist. Tie that now to this farce that we're watching with the January 6th committee. If you've been reading about that, seeing what Liz Cheney and all the cohorts are doing in Washington, D.C. Now think about it. The, the thing that absolutely flips these people out that are the ones that are behind books like this, articles like this. Um, I had another big screed that I read about this from another professor. Two professors are from Boston University. And one guy's title is narrator and advocate. So what they're doing is they're creating a narration, a story, not a true story. It's propaganda about who we are and what we, what we want. Because what they're saying is that Christian nationalists, really, all we want to do is we want to deprive everybody else of their rights. We want to deprive people of, of skin color that isn't our skin color, of their rights. We want to keep them down. Our whole desire is to oppress people. We hate Muslims. We don't want to uh, have anything to do with them. We want to oppress Muslims. We are so xenophobic 
and we don't like open borders. So, I mean, this is bizarre. It's like millions of people have come in across our borders. It's causing un unparalleled havoc in our nation. And they're saying, we're the bad guys because we want to have control of our borders. I mean, what they're advocating is insane. It's insane. But this is how bizarre our times are because they truly are going to journalists, they're going to academia, they're going to corporations, they're going to seminaries, they're going to pastors, they're going to evangelical pastors, to evangelical leaders. And I have been hearing this in evangelical circles that the worst threat that there is out there right now is Christian nationalism. Because these Christian nationalists, really all they are is a bunch of haters that hate black people and hate, they hate this and hate that and hate that. And they want to take over the country. And we have to make sure that we purge Christian nationalists out of our congregations, out of our seminaries. We can't have anything to do with them. This is growing and it's just starting. And the way that this propaganda works is that they give a name, they give a definition, they make it toxic. You don't want to have anything to do with it. So then if someone turns and says, are you a Christian nationalist? You sound like a Christian nationalist. What's your first response? No, no, I'm not a Christian nationalist. No, I wouldn't be like that. That's not me. Just realize this is absolutely phony, baloney stuff. They created a term, they infused it with a false definition, and then they insult you and accuse you that that's who you are. So then the church is on defense. And why do they want to do this? They are absolutely singularly obsessed that in 2016, their candidate didn't get elected. That's what this is about. I mean, is this bizarre? But they are still smarting that Donald Trump won in 2016. And the thing that they figured out, the reason why Donald Trump won is because Christian nationalists, in their opinion, backed him. The people who backed him were people who are spiritually active, governmentally engaged, who read their Bible and know what the Bible says. They looked at the platform of the Democrat Party. They looked at the pr platform of the Republican Party. They saw Antonin Scalia just died, and a Supreme Court justice was going to be appointed. Pretty important. Did they trust Hillary? Did they trust Donald Trump? They didn't really like Donald Trump, but they looked at Hillary Clinton, so they looked back at Donald Trump, and they pulled the lever. He got in. And they're still going nuts over it to this day. So like, why would you be so obsessed? I mean, I, I'm sure you don't know that I probably didn't vote for Joe Biden, but I didn't. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you that right now. But I mean, I don't spend all day spitting nails because Joe Biden won. I mean, it, it's what happened and you deal with it and you move on. Not so with this crowd. I mean, it's, it's so obsessive that it almost seems like it's satanically inspired. And so it's this over-the-top reaction that I've never seen before. Now, this has happened before. This has happened in history in China, in Germany, in authoritarian countries. And so they look for a scapegoat. They look for somebody to blame for their problems. And I want you to know about this because I don't want you to be caught off guard. That's one thing that Jan Show does so well. She goes to the hot button issue and she lets believers know what's happening. Well, I'm telling you, this is what's happening. I hadn't heard about it until earlier this spring. And then I started researching. Have, have any of you heard of this one fellow? He had another name and then he changed his name to Ibrahim X. Kendi. K-E-N-D-I from Boston University. He's been making just boatloads of money going out to corporations and academic institutes and appearing on TV. And so he's out there pushing this whole notion about racism, 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 and all the corpor corporations have to now adopt woke policies like diversity, inclusion, equity. 
That's the new ideology that's being pushed in America. So in government, uh, Donald Trump found out that critical race theory, which is diversity, inclusion, equity, they all sound like great terms, they're not. He found out this was being taught to federal employees. He got rid of it. Joe Biden, the second he got in, he put it back in. Why is this important to our conversation? Ideology and philosophy matter. You see, our nation was founded by people who had a belief in God and a belief in scripture. And their values and their attitudes came from that understanding. They wanted to be obedient to a holy God. And they tried to live that personally and they wanted the society to reflect that. That view is hated. That view that took the United States of America to the highest heights of any nation in the world, that's hated. They want to pull that philosophy down. Remember when Barack Obama said in five days we're going to transform the United States of America? That has to be transformed through philosophy. So the philosophy of the pilgrims and the Puritans and the early settlers, all of that now is being swept off the table and the new, but there's no vacuum. The new ideology is coming in right in behind. Diversity, inclusion, equity, and you've heard of ESG for corporations where it's the sustainability and the, the equity and the governance. The whole point is equality of outcome. And whereas in the United States of America, it was merit and past experience and performance that would allow for hiring and that would allow for promotion, that's not true anymore. The two number one criterion, and this is stated by, if you're familiar with Jordan Peterson, a professor in Toronto, Canada, he's been on a lot of YouTubes out there, he just quit his job, he resigned from the University of Toronto, he couldn't take it anymore, the diversity, inclusion, equity agenda. Because he said, I couldn't in good conscience anymore bring in PhD students and train them knowing full well they'd never get a job after years of laboring and spending all that money because they didn't go along with this new philosophy. You see, this is a huge thing that's happening. Listen to me. This is huge. The whole philosophy that we grew up with in this country swept right off the table into the trash can. That is like old stuff. And we want nothing to do with it. And if any of you Christians out there dare talk about the United States in a positive way or dare say that the founders were worthy of being heroes, why do you think they pull those statues down? They absolutely hate the philosophy that built up America. Now, does that seem insane? That's what brought the greatest nation, the greatest economy, the greatest freedom. We've been the greatest resource for other nations and people in trouble. Whenever there's trouble, we're there. But they hate it. And so that philosophy in their mind, hey, that's gone. You Idiot Christians, you backward Neanderthals, what is wrong with you? Get with the program. Diversity, inclusion, equity, ESG, if you're a corporation, get with it. You see, there's only one philosophy, no questions asked. Everybody on board or get off the bus. Do you see that? It's the big shut up. We're living through the big shut up. And that's what the cancel culture is. And the skunk at the garden party were the Christians who showed up in 2016 and foiled their little plan and their party because they were just going to keep going. So they doubled down. They put everything they possibly could in to 2020. And so they were so upset that, that Donald Trump ran again. Because you see, they had one impeachment. They thought like with Richard Nixon and Watergate, they'd shame the guy, he'd resign. He didn't resign, he went up in the polls after the first impeachment. So they had to have a second impeachment that he had colluded with Russia to win in 20, 2016 because he couldn't have possibly won on his own. Well, that went a little better for them. It hurt Donald Trump, but not that much. 
So now, hence the January 6th committee, the third impeachment. Because you see, they have to try and come up with evidence. That's why they're trying to bring in Peter Navarro, the former Commerce Secretary, trying to bring in Mark Meadows, the former Chief of Staff, trying to bring in Steve Bannon, who was um, a senior advisor. They're trying to bring all these people in so that they'll cop a plea with the committee and they can get state's evidence and then they can give some evidence to Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, and he can give a criminal indictment against Donald Trump so that he'll be so tied up in knots he can't run for president in 2024. That's all this is. I mean, these are selfish monsters. They would destroy your country so these selfish monsters can sit in their positions of power. That's how stupid this game is. Do you get it? This is a magnificent nation that generations built up many for the glory of God, and these people are so shallow and could care less, but there's a, very, there's a few that are really committed to an agenda that has more in common with communist China and communist Russia than anything else we've ever seen before. So this is real stuff. This is big time bingo. This isn't small potatoes anymore. See, this is huge. And the only thing standing in their way for success is you. You. Because 81% of you showed up and voted for that rascal, Donald Trump, in 2016. <laughs> and do you understand that in 2020, like 99% of spiritually active governmentally engaged voters in America showed up in 2020 and voted for Donald Trump. That's why the spiritually active, governmentally engaged are so hated. And it's why this demographic has to be named with a pejorative, hateful, derisive term, lied about with propaganda, saying that you believe things that you don't, that you're racist when you're not ra racist, that you're white nationalist when you're not white nationalist. They have to do every bit of that for you because they have to destroy you. They have to destroy you because they have to destroy a potential Trump presidency because they have to destroy the last vestige of what made America great, which is the foundation of our Judeo-Christian heritage. That's the strength. That's the power. And so where is the solution in all of that? I'm telling you. The, the solution is that we stand even stronger and prouder on the word of God than we have ever stood before. We stand for his name, for his principles. We don't go silent. We don't turn tail and run when we're called a Christian nationalist. We laugh at whoever says it and says, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm going to follow him, and I'm going to go to the voting booth and vote the way that I believe the Lord wants me to vote. I'm not listening to you. So this has worked over and over. It's one of the oldest tricks out of the communist playbook there is, that you find your target, you, I, you define that target, you make them toxic, and you make them want to run away from it. You think this hasn't happened before? It happens all the time. And people run for it. I dealt with it when I was in Congress. I'm telling you, you want to talk about a bunch of wimps and babies? Go to Congress. We're talking wimps and babies royal. Because the last thing they want is to be called a name. And the one thing they can't stand risk being called is a racist. So when you turn on TV every night, if you, I know you all watch CNN and MSNBC, <laughs> when you watch these channels, what is it? These Republicans, they're racy racist. They're racist. They're racist. They're racy racist. They're the racy raciest I've ever seen in my life. They're so racy racist every night. And so guess what freaks Republicans out? <gasps> They just call me a racist. Oh, no, this is terrible. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. I promise you I'm not. It's like, come on. What happened to you? Stand up. Stand up for her. You know who you are. Don't take this. Don't accept that, what they're putting on you. So as pastors, 
We have got to stand with our pastors. We've got to encourage our pastors. We need to have more congregations having more seminars on America's godly heritage, not lest, not be shamed into not having people talk about it. We need to have more pastors talking about what does the Bible have to say about immigration? What does the Bible have to say about taxes? What does the Bible have to say about guns or, or the death penalty? Or what does the Bible have to say about life? The Bible has, to say, has something to say about all Almost every issue in life. Wouldn't a congregation want to know? Yes. A pastor will preach to them if he feels like his congregation wants to know. So we have to have our pastors back. And we've got to pray. We've got to stand. We've got to pray. In the book of Ephesians, it says, having done all, stand. And so now I've warned you with what it isn't coming, it's here. So the battle is on, and the battle is raging. And just understand that this is our go time. This is our glory time. This is when we get to stand up. So what's the first thing we have to know? We have to know our God. We have to know the word. We have to know that there is a God who loves every single human that's ever lived on this planet. And that this God loves us so much, he humbled himself, he came to this earth, he lived a perfect life in the man named Jesus, and he willingly went to the cross, and he paid for the sins of you and me and every person that ever lived. And because he died on that cross and rose again, it means that every single one of us can live we can live, we can be a new life and have a new creation. We don't have to live in this sin-sick body because everybody's a sinner, but we can let that go. And instead, we can t accept his free gift of salvation, of eternal life, of living with him forever. Best deal ever. <laughs> and it's free. We have something to shout about. We have something to rejoice about. So, Father, tonight, we praise you. We come into your presence with thanksgiving. We come into your courts with praise, freely, happily, rejoicing in your holy name. Despite all that's coming down around our ears, this society, Father, <coughs> that in so many ways has turned its back on you, mocks you, scoffs you, but that's what an unregenerate mind and soul does. And so I pray, oh God, that here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, at Mall of America, here in Minnesota, where so many times we have mocked your name, Lord, we ask your forgiveness. We ask your forgiveness for our state, for our, our sins, Father. And we ask, Lord, that you would reveal yourself here in Minnesota. Lord, you have brought revival here before. Lord, your presence was made known here. You have answered prayer here. You have brought miracles to this state. Billy Graham had his headquarters here in Minneapolis for so many years. We were so blessed, Christian publishing houses and universities, and you've so blessed us. But Lord, we ask, until you tarry, Lord, would you yet bring a dispensation to this state? Would you bring your dispensation to every one of the 50 states? Would you reveal yourself? Anyone watching tonight who doesn't know you, would you reveal yourself to that one who doesn't know you? That they would receive you even now and then become eternally yours forever, never separated from you again, and become a new creation in Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you. We don't have to fear we don't have to be intimidated by this national smear campaign of Bible-believing Christians called Christian nationalism. We just call it out for what it is, Father. It's lies. That's all it is. Lies can't hurt us. Father, we are protected by your blood, by your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would meet the need of every person watching tonight online, meet the needs of every person in this room, Lord, as we go forth in these troublesome days, give us joy in the journey. And I thank you, Father, that we stand strong in you, strong in the power of your might, not intimidated by these people. And we don't hate the people who wrote this book. 
We pray for them. We pray for their salvation. We ask, Lord, that no man, no woman will go into eternity without a chance of knowing you because hell is real and heaven is real. And it's your desire that all men and all women choose you. And so that is how we unite in prayer tonight for the salvation, salvation of those who do not know you. In your name I pray, amen. AI with holograms is getting so sophisticated. I'm not joking, Gary. They can create any image of anybody at any age, from baby to adult, from young person to elderly, you name it. It is so realistic. You could literally, it's not cartoonish, it's none of that stuff. It's so real. you could literally see the, the pores in their skin, the individual hairs on them. It, it's so realistic. Now, mm -hmm. that's crazy enough as it is. But you combine this with AI, and it's not just a realistic image of anybody you want, including the Antichrist. Yeah. But, which then could speak and communicate around the world. But it's not pre-scripted speech, right? This AI, and we give an example, and this was out of Australia. This AI, they showed an AI baby, right? And they were teaching it. And you're, you gotta see this. The, the, the guy says, let me show you. It's, it's not just the image, it looks like a real baby, you know, like, a, like, a, like a two year old. Hmm. And, and he says, hold up a picture. So it's in the computer screen, this AI virtual baby looking thing, toddler, and he holds up a picture of a dog. He just holds it up. He says, first get, get the attention. He's going, hi, hi AI baby. That's what he did. And so the AI looks at him, right? And you get the frown, the features, the, it, the alert, the eye, it's just, just like a real person. And he holds it up and he goes, hi AI baby, what's this? And it literally in real time goes, puppy. It knew what it was seeing from, through the computer screen. He holds up another one, Apple, right? This thing in real time was communicating through the computer screen via an image with this guy having an actual conversation with him. Gary, now you fast forward yes. to this image of the Antichrist that says it speaks and causes all who don't do what he says, i.e. worship the image, working with the false, that you're gonna die. Yeah. The technology's here. So there it is, get it in your calendar, October 6th. We're gonna have a great night together. Well, at this time, let's welcome our panel. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing with us. We're going to come back to that very topic of uh, Christian nationalism. But, Jane, you've got a table back there. Why don't you share with us what's, what's yes. on the table? Yes, uh, we have an olive tree table, and we've got some things that I think will, will be a compliment for tonight. Um, I'm just going to reference a few of them. We've got a DVD of previous Understanding the Times. The last one, The Reset Rising, Mark Hitchcock and Jeff Kinley is back there. Um, Pastor Brandon Holthouse in April is back there, and Pastor Tom Hughes in February. Um, so those are <clears throat> some of the events that we've had here. We've had, this is a year now. We started with Michelle last August. We've had well over one million electronic viewers since a year ago. So we're, <laughs> we're making the beast system work for us. Um, <clears throat> might as well, as long as we have the time. <laughs> Um, I think the most popular product we have, and I don't say this, please don't hear me say this from a, a sale uh, standpoint, but the content is this <clears throat> Before the Wrath DVD. It's got, an, it's a drama, but it's got commentators, J.D. Farag, Jack Hibbs, Amir Serafati. I mean, I make a few comments myself, and it's, it, it's going back looking at the Galilean Jewish wedding and how that ties to the rapture and convinces us of, quite frankly, the pre-tribulation rapture. So in an hour, a little bit more than an hour, it's all in this wonderful DVD. And then we do carry Pastor Mark's book, I think a church called and might have ordered 50 today, and it's the man code. 12 essentials every man needs to know, and quite frankly, gals, you might need to know it too, to know who to date, okay? Um, so we have that on the, and lots of other products um, on the back table that we'll hope you, hope, we hope you'll take advantage of. And I think, um, and then also our newsletter, our magazine, if you wouldn't mind taking our magazine 
and that will keep you apprised, as well as signing up for our e-newsletter of what's coming up ahead here. And I couldn't help but think, as you were sharing and, and, and kind of winding down, and we want to kind of expand on some of this. We're going to show some clips here in a few minutes, and then we're, the three of us are going to comment, and some of the clips tie directly to what Michelle shared. Uh, other clips are going to expand it a little bit more. We're in a, in a generation now where every man is doing what is right in their own eyes. The people she talked about think they're doing the right thing. Obviously, they're serving Satan, but they think they're doing the right thing in their own eyes. They're doing the right thing. And we're in the times of Isaiah 520, where evil is being called good and good is being called evil. So I, I think we need to rejoice First of all, rejoice that we're a part of this generation, as Michelle said. What a privilege to be a part of the things that were yeah, difficult, painful, um, keep you up at night for sure. But still, the things that we are witnessing, what did you expect the last days to look like? What, a picnic? Every man doing what is right in his own eyes and evil being called good and good being called evil. That's what the last days are going to look like. And we're in them. That's exactly right. And, uh, you know, tonight you were talking about this Christian nationalism. And you're absolutely right. It's all propaganda. It's propaganda. Friends, it's propaganda. If you're younger than me, look at me. This is propaganda. Read history. Read the Bible. I promise you it's propaganda. My dad committed suicide when I was five years old. I was adopted and abandoned, raised by my grandfather. He's a World War II veteran. Of course, we talked about President Ike Eisenhower. He was uh, the one who was a supreme commander of the Allied troops against the Germans. He was the one that sent people in to take pictures of the concentration camps and said, take these pictures because in the days ahead, people won't believe this happened. Well, let me just show you a little clip of something that happened when he was uh, president, something that he said, listen to these words, without God there can be no American form of government. Did you hear that? This guy's the president of the United States. This guy has just delivered the world, God used him to deliver the world and the, uh, save the Jewish nation so they would not be eradicated. That's a pretty significant thing in biblical history. He goes on from there and says, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Thus the founding fathers, so who does he reference here? The founding fathers. The founding fathers of America saw it, and thus with God's help it will continue to be so. Well, it's, it's, it's being, the propaganda is eradicating that. And I so appreciated the way that you shared with us tonight. I want you two ladies to, to watch... Um, if you, if you do a search on Christian nationalism and hit video, you will see video after video after video. I mean, hordes of them expressing the fact. It doesn't matter your, your skin tone. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe that God's ways are the best thing for a nation, for a people, you're going to be vilified. Watch this. 70% of Americans identify as Christian. And this segment is not about most of them. This segment is about the rise of a white Christian nationalist movement in the U.S. It's emerging in the news more and more. You're probably hearing the term Christian nationalism more and more. Here is one expert's definition. Quote, Christian nationalism is the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and that the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Many observers feel that would threaten a diverse democracy, healthy democracy in the U.S. We are seeing some Republican politicians in the U.S. embrace the term Christian nationalism. For example, Marjorie Taylor Greene the other day, doubling down on past comments, she tweeted, Christian nationalism is what this nation needs. Lauren Boebert said she's tired of the U.S. separation of church and state. And the GOP nominee, nominee for governor of Pennsylvania, Doug Mastriano, has been in the news in recent days uh, for his campaign's apparent payments to Gab, a social media platform with ties to white nationalists, where a gunman posted a video uh, before going inside that Pittsburgh synagogue and killing worshipers in 2018. Uh, Mastriano in the news, other candidates in the news about this. So I want to bring in a guest 
who has analyzed this subject for years and knows it better than almost anyone. Uh, she has this uh, uh, recent guest essay in the New York Times titled, Christian Nationalists Are Excited About What Comes Next. She's been following the movement for over 12 years, attending right-wing strategy meetings, conferences, and activist gatherings. Catherine Stewart is her name. She's the author of The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. Catherine, let's define our terms first. I think a lot of viewers are hearing Christian nationalism more and more. What is it? Christian nationalism is basically the idea that America was founded as a so-called Christian nation. Uh, our laws should be based on the Bible and the uh, supposedly right-thinking uh, believers need to reclaim uh, America's uh, past. It's also... That what heals the country will be saved through religion. Why do you say that's so dangerous? Well, it's dangerous because it's a radically anti-democratic ideology. Um, it rejects the principles of pluralism and equality that represent the best of the American promise. Um, the movement, it's not just an ideology, it's also a, an organized quest for political power. Power um, is the key word here. That's right. It's a political movement. And this, is, this movement has built up um, a lot of different, a sort of a dense organizational infrastructure mm. over decades that includes right-wing policy groups, legal advocacy groups, networking initiatives that get the leadership on the same page. Supreme Court justices? Supreme Court justices. So one of the problems is we're hearing a lot about the six Supreme Court justices, conservative justices on the Supreme Court, but we don't hear enough about the Federalist Society, which is a, an organization that plays an outsized role in shaping our courts. All six conservative members of the Supreme Court are current or have current or former ties to the Federalist Society. And as I mentioned in the intro, you've been writing about this for years. Why is it in the news more now? Why are these lawmakers suddenly using these terms and in some cases embracing this idea? Well, I think Trump actually threw open the doors to leaders of this movement. It's a leadership-driven movement. Um, it's not defined by the attitudes of the rank and file. Those attitudes are actually shaped by the leadership of the movement. Mm. He offered them unprecedented political access, uh, offered them, of course, the justices they wanted. Uh, leaders of the movement, um, listen, this is a movement that represents a minority of our country. Most American Christians reject the politics of conquest and division. I think wow is the right word, isn't it? Now, Michelle, you're trained as a lawyer, and uh, you serve... You serve as the dean mm -hmm. uh, over the studies of government. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just ask you a question. Don't laws deal with the subject of morality? Absolutely, they all do. Even speeding laws. All, every law almost has a moral base to it. Ethically right and wrong. And what is good and what helps a society, that's what law is about. Yeah, so, so when they're saying, you know, like, we've got Christians that want to make decisions on moral issues, and they can't do that, do you understand the insult that is to God? Because there's only two kingdoms, and we learn morality from God, we don't learn it from our culture. Jan, as you, as you listen to that, what stood out in your mind? Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> what's on my mind, quite frankly, is the one you're going to show next, uh, because that is so totally shocking. If we don't want to go the route of... Um, godliness, the option to that is going to be paganism. And, and, and what's on the horizon, folks, I, th I think we just ought to show it because it's pretty staggering. Yeah. So, so keep in mind what Michelle shared with you. The vilification of anybody who believes in Jesus doesn't matter your skin tone. Now it's going to be vilified as, as white suppressors. But just keep in mind I met with some African-American leaders who are zealous for Jesus. They're being vilified. I just want you to understand that. And they're being called Christian nationalists as well. Absolutely they so, are. So black believers in Jesus Christ are being called racist. Yeah. So this is how bizarre this is. This yeah. is this satanic hatred that there is. Because again, remember, it's sweep away the old ideology right. of what you learned about America this is the new ideology, and there is no disagreement, and so you're going to be intimidated to silence. That's what's happening. It, this is a movement, what you just saw on CNN. This is all meant to intimidate, because again, what she was saying were lies, because they've defined a term, they've falsely defined it, they falsely said what you believe, and then now you have to stand up in a 
in a defensive posture saying, no, I don't. No, I don't. What are you talking about? And so when you start out on defense, you lose almost every time. And so that's why I want to give you, you know, a, a hat tip on this so that you know what we're facing right now in America, what the church is facing, what your pastor is facing. I talked to a pastor here in the Twin Cities about this issue who's a good pastor, but he'd been told that crash, Christian nationalism is this really bad thing, and they had to watch out for it, and it's dangerous, and they got to watch out for it in their church. And I'm telling you, that propaganda, bing, hit the target. That's exactly what the intention was, to, th to divide us. See, this divides us. So I'm not going to be a Christian nationalist. I'm going to be an acceptable Christian, somebody who's acceptable to the culture. Well, that's a dangerous thing, to be acceptable to the culture. We want to be acceptable to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's exactly my point. Thank you so much again for sharing with us. I want, you to, I want you to catch this. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you believe that there's sin in the world. You've sinned against God. We've broken the Ten Commandments. That's why Jesus died on the cross, right? And so if you're a Christian, you read through the Bible. You understand the Ten Commandments are God's revelation about morality. Now, let me just be really honest. If you say... If we kept the Ten Commandments, monkeypox wouldn't be much of an issue. I'm serious. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, we do. But for me saying that, I'm going to be vilified. And I'm just going to say, once you remove Christianity, you will have paganism. I want you to see this video clip. And you just... could lose your job over it. Yes, ma'am. You could. Yep. Th there's a lot of problems that come with this. People have no idea how strict and how serious these enforcers are. That's how it works in propagandist authoritarian countries. That's what they're trying to make America into right now. An authoritarian propaganda-based country. And that's what we talked about the whole time that I was in Israel. Because these people had lived in those countries. They fled those countries to get to Israel. And now they're seeing it in the United States. Yeah. They literally can't believe it, what's happening. So you just saw a clip of Brian Stelter. I'm shocked this guy still has a job. Yeah. And you saw a clip of this guy. And so they're advancing the propaganda. You're going to see it everywhere. But where you're really going to see it? is in the church. Get prepared. That's the battleground. They don't need CNN. They need the seminaries. They need the pastors intimidated. <laughs> they need to get evangelical leaders intimidated. They won't. They so that's why you've got to be in the know about what this is. Yeah, they've been very Amen. successful. Yeah. Okay, so if you remove Christianity, we're going to have paganism. I want you to see this. The uh, Commonwealth Games. So the Commonwealth, England, uh, all of the countries that have been connected in the past with England, big games. This happened uh, this last week in England. I want you to see this. This, this is shocking. Watch this. Bull was shrinking before our eyes. It's a bull with a soft heart. It is Stella and the dreamers and the power of the shards that can help the ball, bringing about reconciliation and creating a new harmony, a new place for everyone. Is that a tear I see in a ball's eye? I told you he had a soft center. A very emotional ball. Covered in armor, and again, it is Stella that comes to help. Those multi purpose shards working their magic once again.
cultural symphony we have seen recognizing the journey Birmingham has been on towards multiculturalism and how they have had to overcome moments of misunderstanding and tension but eventually leading here to mutual tolerance. A message of hope. as a fresh start, becoming that symbol of light and of love. Jen, what did okay. you see? Europe threw God out 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. As a result, they're worshiping Baal. That's what you saw. They're worshiping Baal. Because they threw, that's what happened. You're going to have one or the other. Um, the Bible says in the last days, evil will go away. Evil will wax worse and worse and worse. Um, how far the dark side has come, I would say, in the last 25 years, and even in the last 10 years, is staggering. It's just staggering. So, I mean, if, even if you're just following the headlines, you're going to see that this is common now, but this was devil worship in, in the UK because they've thrown God out. There are serious consequences when we do that. Michelle, what stood out to you as you saw Pardon? that? What stood out to you as you saw that video? Well, it reminded me of Switzerland where they had, uh, they had fin completed a tunnel. Gotthard ba Gotthard based tunnel in 2016. They had something that looked very similar. Yeah. And so you That's see right. these rituals, but the rituals are based on worship. And it reminds me, Pastor, of the book of Genesis. I mean, nothing's new under the sun, Solomon said. And so the serpent wanted worship. That was his whole thing. It's, you know, pride and lifting himself. He wanted to be above God. Nothing has changed. So the one thing we need to recognize, there is only one true God. There's only one. And so every other God is false. So this was garbage that we just saw now, but it's a false God. And whether people are playing a game and going along with it, it's as dangerous as it gets. And it's what I was talking about. Just keep that image in mind. We got to throw everything out now everything that is godly, everything that we have known, history, we got to throw it all out. And now it's the new. This is your new. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what you're giving away? The magnificent society, everything that was laid as a predicate, the price that was paid for what we have, and you're just going to slide everything off that table, and this is the garbage you get? It is the worst form of cruelty and torture. People have no idea the consequences that come with this. And it doesn't take long. It happens like that in a nanosecond. And once it's gone, you don't get to go back. Nope. You don't get hit to hit the back button and you get it back. It's gone. And then you're living in a living hell. And so that's what we saw was a foretaste. You know, we're living like in the days of Jonah. Jonah had a message, a warning, 40 days and God's judgment is going to come. Friends, if you remove Christianity, you will have another idol. And we can see in that video where these idols are moving us to. I just want to quickly comment to a couple of them. We may not be able to show this on some platforms. You might have to look at Rumble to find that videotape again. But as you watch it, you'll notice there's a lady sitting on the beast. There's a, the imagery is fascinating if you know the, if you know the Bible. Uh, you can read it in the book of Revelation. And you say, well, that's not the fulfillment of it. But my point is, you had all those people bowing down. Did you listen to some of the terms? The bull is bringing in a new time of harmony where there's diversity and equity. Talks there about how there is hope in the bull and love in the bull and the bull is light. Did you see the, did you see the crystals that they had? That's, that's Hinduism. And you want to find out what Hinduism brings? Go to India. Yeah. Go to Kathmandu. It's not going to be pretty. This is, this is a warning. Our friends may be vilifying us, but I'm telling you, they are on a trajectory that has huge, massive consequences that we don't want any of our friends to experience in this life 
or in the life to come. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So my question to you two ladies is this. Give us, how do we respond to this? I, I, you've, got a, you've got a prayer time, fasting and prayer time coming up. Yeah. In fact, if you look up there on the screen, 40 days of prayer and fasting, tell us about that. Uh, if you if you would, Michelle. Yes, um, this is something that I'm really looking forward to. We've done this now. This is the fourth or the fifth year. And on the Jewish calendar, the holiest day of the year is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And in the Bible, the prophets often went for 40 days in prayer and fasting. Jesus went for 40 days. That's this 40 days that we're coming up to. It'll end uh, Yom Kippur. I think it's October 4th. But what I want to do is invite all of you and everyone online. You can invite anyone else you want. We did this last year. We had people all over the world join us. We meet for a half hour in the morning on the phone or like on Zoom, I guess we do it. And um, everyone is welcome. And we pray for a half hour. We stop exactly at a half hour. We invite everyone to fast the way that you want to fast before the Lord. You don't have to fast, but I encourage everyone to fast. And I have to tell you, I look forward to it. It is the most powerful spiritual experience of the year. And we sponsor this at Regent University. We have seen miracles come out of this. We pray for salvations. We pray for all sorts of things. But we are coming before the Lord, humbling ourselves. And it's the beginning of the new year in the Jewish calendar. So really what we're doing is we're dedicating the year to the Lord. And it ends in the 10 days of awe and wonder from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. So it's a time of confession and repentance, humbling ourselves from the Lord, but also a lot of joy in the midst of it and giving him our year. And that's what I, mean, I just can't even tell you the, literally the miracles that we have seen from this 40 days of prayer and fasting. And when you look at these things, I mean, that's despairing. I, I did, hadn't seen that video clip before of that whole mechanical beast thing. And the joy, I mean, I think part of the reason why I feel so much joy in my life right now is the prayer and the fasting. And it's a half hour in the morning. I think it, we do it at 8 o'clock on the East Coast. So it'd be 7 o'clock in the morning here. For people in Australia, they're up like at 2 in the morning. But we've got people joining us from every day from places like that because they want the fellowship. And so it's live, interactive. You can pray, you know, it, it, on this call. So join us. Go to RSG Dean's office at regent.edu. And um, then you can join in, and anybody can join. So if you can't be on the line every day, that's fine. We just want to offer this to you because this will be a blessing in your life, and it's hope. It's what we can do. And prayer isn't just like something nice. I'm telling you, it's everything. It's absolutely everything. And with the fasting with it, you want to move mountains in the United States? I have this sense this, this fall that... I don't know, like something, I, I just have kind of this sense that there's bad things planned for yeah, this fall. I do too. And so that's why I want to be praying into it now. Yeah. Prayer and fasting. So join us if you'd like to. Yeah. Okay, so when we see these things unfolding around us, number one, prayer and fasting. That's definitely biblical. Anything else, Jan, you want to add to how we strengthen ourselves? Because the question is, we see these things, it's like, what do we do next? Well, I think we need to be informed. I mean, having events such as this, I mean, I think that we're going to be apprising and informing you know, thousands of people. I hate to say it, but the church, most of them are uninformed because the pulpits are silent. The pulpits aren't talking about some of the things that we're sharing tonight. And, you know, and that's not to beat up on pastors. I believe that's the toughest job in the whole world is to be a pastor. But at the same time, the people are starving for some of the information that we need to be able to cope. And that's going to get more and more difficult until the Lord takes the church home, which, by the way, could be tonight. Amen to that. So, so prayer and fasting, uh, information. But then, friends, I would suggest you we got to go back to the promises of God. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as Amen. your Savior, listen, Amen. Psalm 23 deals with a meditation it deals with uh, the comfort, and it deals with confidence. And you've got to have that order as you read through the book of Psalms. You, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. It goes on down through there. There's comfort in it. 
You comfort me with your staff, your presence. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, what? You are with me. That's where the comfort is. And then you remember the last part there, surely goodness and you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for how long? Ever. So we got to come back to the promises of God. Friends, that's what Daniel did. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did when they put up the idols and said, you've got to worship the golden idols, or in this case, the bull, just like we see in Exodus chapter 32 with the golden calf. I mean, it's fascinating. Unbelievable. Okay, so, so ladies, let's move to the next one here. Lockdowns. Lockdowns. Are lockdowns coming? Let's watch this. We're learning that a World Health Organization staffers written a report saying that a climate lockdown could be called for. It's like a COVID lockdown, a climate lockdown. Mark Morano is an author who has written a lot about climate change. He founded Climate Depot. He joins us tonight. Mark, thanks so much for coming on. A climate lockdown. Now, I would laugh this off the table, except we all just lived through the last 18 months, so we know that anything is possible. What does this mean exactly? Well, you know, in my book, Green Fraud, I detail two chapters on this, Tucker. This is the climate activists were, first of all, jealous when the COVID lockdowns happened. They were beside themselves saying, how is this happening? Everyone from Greta Thunberg to John Kerry, UN officials. And then they started saying, we need to follow this. If we can shut down for a virus, we can shut down for climate. And that's what we're seeing. There's even academics in Australia proposing adding climate change to death certificates. And Bill Gates has said the death toll will be greater. So they're following every step of the way. And it's not just, you know, a, a professor here or someone in academia. We have a major U.K. report coming out. We have an international agency report that came out uh, calling for essentially the same type of lockdowns, everything from restrictions on your thermostat to restrictions of moving. Uh, you know, you can only fly in a climate emergency when it's, quote, morally justifiable. You know, kind of like a lockdown, you have to justify going to the store for essential services. They're going after freedom of movement. They're going after private car ownership. They're going after uh, everything it means to be a free person and turning it over to the administrative state. Would this include shutting down the iPhone factories in China? <laughs> yeah. Okay, 52-page document. I just, uh, just printed it off. Executive order on tackling climate crisis home and abroad. This is right off the White, uh, the White House uh, briefing. Uh, yeah. Michelle, well, and this is how the president has operated, yes. is under emergency powers. That's how all these tragic things happen in our lives. It wasn't Congress passing a bill. It is the emergency powers that were taken by the executive. And it happened under Donald Trump, too, at the end of his presidency. It was emergency powers that six, eight trillion dollars got spent. This is real money. You know, the whole budget of the United States government is like about two trillion. I mean, you got to realize during COVID, it was like six to eight trillion dollars that were spent. Here in the state of Minnesota, we've got billions of dollars sitting around that's COVID money. And they're trying to figure out all the ways that they can spend it on their political friends for this upcoming election. This is sick. You want to know why we have inflation? Because $8 trillion got printed and thrown out. That's why, with nothing behind it, right. no value. So all of our money just collapsed. And so this garbage that just came out about this new infrastructure bill, it should, it should be called the new inflation bill because right. that's yeah. what they're doing. But this bill is all about giving unlimited executive powers to the president of the United States. So he virtually is a dictator. He's been a dictator for the last 18 months. And we've seen this with the World Health Organization. Yes. They saw how great this worked. The president had emergency powers. Hey, I can lock people down. I can destroy middle-class businesses. They could do anything they wanted to do. Now they wanted to take it international to the UN and give that power to Tedros at the World Health Organization. And so now they're proposing the Global Pandemic Treaty. And so they want to give that kind of power to him at the WHO. And this is, it's always been two things. It's either been climate change was going to be their key for global government. Yes. And now this spring, they tried to go through the World Health Organization yeah. because of COVID. That's been their key. But just realize the end goal is global government. Yes. It's always been their game. And we are so close. 
You can't even believe it. They thought they were going to have it in May. They thought it was slam dunk. Believers got involved, fasted, prayed. The whole thing miraculously fell apart in the end of May because yeah. believers got involved. Yep. So that's why I believe in the power of prayer and fasting and, and God's know, sovereign will. <laughs> and you know, they say Christian nationalists are against the republic. Hello, executive orders are yes. against the yes. republic. Yes, that's right. Do you, do you, under, you understand that? There's right. this thing called the executive office, but the, he's only supposed to follow the it's laws. It's an unconstitutional yes. grab at power. This is not constitutional, what they're doing. And that's why, why would we take it? Why would we say, oh, okay, I guess I'll be locked down for the next two weeks. I mean, no, this is it, done. Take the masks off. Don't be locked down. You don't have to do any of this anymore. Sorry. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, this, is be this is becoming creation worship. I mean, this whole climate issue um, is beginning to be... It's, it's the religion of the left is, is creation worship and, and some of the things that uh, they're promising... To, uh, to, uh, Take away all our freedoms. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Take away anything that it means to be a free person, including travel, mm -hmm. could be taken away. Mm -hmm. As soon as this fall, mm -hmm. she has a premonition about, I do too, that something is coming up this fall that's going to be a challenge, and, and perhaps it's this. Recently, I was with some pastors. We flew down to Atlanta, Georgia, and there was a speaker there at this pastor's conference, this leadership conference, and he spoke on this subject, how if you're a real Christian, you're going to make sure that you recycle and do these different things. And you go to your neighbor, and if he doesn't recycle, you love him in Jesus and recycle his trash for him. <laughs> I took these two young seminary students, and actually they were already pastoring, and I took them to dinner, and I said, do you know who the greatest polluter is in the world? And both of them looked at me and thought, America? And I smiled, and I said, no. And they said, well, it must be China then. I said, no. I said, have you not read Revelation chapter 8, and it's talking about the trumpet judgments that Jesus is going to pour out on the earth? Can I just tell you? Can I just read this to you? Listen to this. Yeah. It says, the first sounded, and a third of the earth was burned up. A third. A, a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the grass was burned up. And then it talks about in the sea, and then it talks about how uh, the fish die, and then the whales die. And, and friends, my point is simply this. Man worships the creation Amen. instead of the creator, and God does not share his glory. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus is going to destroy this earth. Just so you know, there's going to be a new heavens, a new earth, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. And, and I, for those of you that are younger, I want you to catch this. If you're going on a trip to California, you calculate how much how much you need to get there. There is a timeline for the earth. God's given natural resources to the, to the earth for our needs. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And God's provision is there. Utilize it. Use good stewardship. But we do not worship the creation. We worship the creator. Amen. Okay, ladies, these last videos, we're going to go very quick. Next one is uh, the subject of banking. We've seen this in China. Let's just watch this again. That's a video showing tanks lined up on the road in China. It's shocking the internet with over 2 million views. Now, tanks are on the streets in China out to protect the banks. This is because the Henan branch of the Bank of China is declaring that people's savings in their own branch are now investment products and cannot be withdrawn. This clip shows a long queue of tanks preventing locals from reaching the bank branch. And as the camera pans right now, the tank queue is seen covering the entire block. The locals look agitated, but they're forced to wait because of the presence of armed vehicles. Okay, two things, ladies. Here's my questions to you. The tanks are out to protect the banks. What about protecting the people? It's their money that's in the bank. 
And the second thing I would ask, ladies, I want you to comment on this, your savings is just an investment product. Yeah. Talk to us about these two things. <laughs> well, that, that's Orwellian speech. We saw that up in Canada where yeah. Justin Trudeau closed everybody's bank account because yeah. they didn't, anyone who was supporting the Freedom Truckers, their bank accounts were closed. And we've heard a lot of this, the call for the end of cash and that we're going to go to digital banking. And, of course, the only, I mean, who's going to give up their cash? Nobody is. So it's going to have to be a crisis. So if, like, the grid goes down or something and you can't get your money, I mean, can you imagine what this would be like? Well, look at what happened in Shanghai, the, the, the largest city in China. For 63 days, they locked people in their apartments, in their homes. You know millions of people died. I mean, you know it had to have happened. They were locked in there. A lot of people, you know, were, were nailed shut in there, didn't have food. I mean, this is authoritarianism yes. gone crazy. And that's what you just showed. When you deny people access to their money, that's their property. Your, your labor goes to, to get money from your employer, and your money's in the bank for safekeeping. Everything belongs to China. When you're in an authoritarian regime, you have no rights. Everything belongs to the authoritarian. That's what's so unusual about the United States, because all rights were given to us as individual citizens. We gave a little bit of power back to government, but otherwise we retained rights. It's the opposite for China and authoritarian regimes. The authoritarian keeps all the rights, and maybe you'll be lucky to get a peanut butter sandwich. So it's a completely different way of doing things. Like I said, remember this image sweeping the old off the table, and in comes the new. There's your authoritarianism for you. And don't think that this administration isn't capable of separating us from our bank accounts. Oh, yes. Amen. So uh, we've spent time here, plus on air, uh, dealing with the coming digital currency, which has been referenced here, where everything's going to go, di your checking account will go digital. We talked about it here extensively with Brandon Holthouse. Again, I have that DVD back there. Uh, there's been radio I've done on it. I mean, it's, it's coming, the, the coming digital currency, which means cash will go away. The way we do banking will go away. Um, and again, accounting that's... Accounting goes away. Sorry, because sorry? it's it, accounting yes, goes away. Yes, accounting goes away. Because it's the surveillance state. That is right. Literally, you can't buy a piece of gum without government Ex knowing. It. Exactly. Everything you buy, and if you if you're gonna if you're buying too much sugar this week, and you shouldn't be eating sugar, they'll know, and you'll get reported on. I want to make one more announcement that I forgot earlier, and that for those watching and who can't maybe catch it all tonight, everything we're doing tonight will be posted to olivetreeviews.org and then to video within three, four, five days at markhenryministries.com. So if you want to tell people, if you want to hear about what we've talked about, it will be posted to our websites. Let's give it three, four days for editing. But again, I wanted to emphasize that digital currency is coming and it's very, very serious because um, it's surveillance. It's surveilling what you buy. And it's telling you what you can buy and what you can't buy. And that's where, like, when they shut down in China, if you've got digital currency, you're just not getting it. You know, if the authoritarian regime decides that's it, yeah. you're done. You're done. You're done. And that's the ESG yeah. that a lot of corporations are having to follow. So if you aren't, you know, diversity, inclusive, equity, and these sound like great terms, they aren't great terms. They aren't great terms. If you don't follow this... They regulate you, and if you're unfavored, you're out because it's a social credit score. Right here is a, is a pamphlet created by a local bank that was given to one of the businessmen in our church when he was making a deposit. Right across the top, ESG, our community impact. It's a whole pamphlet, so that way the customers there know that they are doing all they can for the environment the social agenda and the governance that is being presented to right. us. Now, time has failed us, so what I'm going to do really quick is we're going to jump ahead to another video. I want you ladies just to respond. You just got back from Israel. Will Israel strike Iran? We've had uh, the, the uh, uh, we had Putin, we had the Russians, of course, in Europe. Uh, they're meeting with the Iranians just a week or so ago uh, in Turkey, and of course that ties to Ezekiel 38 and 39, and there's just a lot of things going on, but 
here's, here's the question. Is Israel at a point where they, they basically got a strike? Let's watch this. A strike by Israel against Iran's nuclear program. Speculation over this possibility has gone on for years. One Israeli analyst has studied the issue for more than a decade, and he has a dire warning about the devastating consequences such action might bring. Chris Mitchell brings us the story. In 2012, Yaakov Katz, now the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, served as the paper's defense analyst. As co-author of Israel versus Iran, The Shadow War, he examined the potential for an attack on Iran's nuclear program. It seemed at the time that Israel was capable of doing it. I, I, I distinctly remember one meeting that I was brought into at the Air Force headquarters in Tel Aviv with the top Air Force general who uh, basically laid out, you know, rolled out a map on a table and showed us how the Israeli Air Force squadrons would fly to Iran. At the time, Israel prepared night and day. The Air Force had been training extensively for this operation. Billions and billions of shekels had been poured in to this planning and, and to training and to buying up the munitions and the, and the technology and the weapons that would be needed to take out some of the facilities. Then Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Ehud Barak tried but failed to convince the cabinet, army and security chiefs to take action. In the end, that never happened. So that was the backdrop back in 2012. And it seemed real, it seemed viable, and it seemed like Israel had a real opportunity to cause enough damage to set back Iran's nuclear program. Now, 10 years later, the problem and targets remain the same. Natanz, Iran's main uranium enrichment facility. Fordo, with thousands of centrifuges burrowed into a mountain. To the west, a rock where a heavy water plutonium facility is under construction. And further south, Iran's uranium conversion facility in Isfahan. Since this scenario hasn't changed in 10 years, what about Israel's military capability? Michelle, you just got back from Israel. You're connected at lots of high levels. Just give us your thoughts there. Well, it's the saddest thing in the world to me that the United States facilitated over $150 billion to Iran exactly yeah. when they were screaming death to America yeah. during the Obama years. And so that funding went from us yeah. to Israel's number one terrorist threat in the world. We didn't, so, even, we didn't even get any oil out of it. No, we, we get nothing out of it. We just, you know, yeah. we, we empowered them. Yeah. That's continued on, unfortunately, now with Joe Biden. He's done everything he can to also empower them. They hate, um, they call Israel the little Satan. They call the United States the big Satan. And they want nuclear weapons, not just for Israel. They can already reach Israel with their weapons. It's for us. Yes. That's what these are for and for any of their enemies. So this is a very real threat. They are the number one terrorist nation in the world and have been since 1979. The difference with Iran is that they have the political will to use them. You have a lot of bad actors in the world with nuclear weapons. The Ayatollahs will use them. Yes. He wrote a book seven years ago that said, we will annihilate Israel in 25 years. They're serious about this. So we're at this cusp. I can tell you when, uh, when I was at the Golan Heights, um, one thing that was a little different is that all night long, I heard helicopters and things all night long, and so there may, you know, there may have been like missions, but this is like the worst possible time for Israel in a lot of ways because Bennett stepped down, they have a caretaker government with Lapid right now, this isn't one you want to make a big decision like that to go and attack someone what, because Israel, this is unprecedented in Israel's history. They're having their fifth election yes. in three years. It's been unstable for three years in Israel. Now, the good thing is the economy is pretty good over there. You know, the private sector is doing pretty well, but politically, they are unstable. They don't know what's going to happen. So to do something like this, and nobody has their backs. Nobody has yeah. their backs. The EU doesn't. The U.S. doesn't. The U.S. Is, uh, the U.S. has never been more anti-Israel than we are right now. Yeah. The, the person that the Biden administration put in charge of Israel and the Middle East is a complete um, anti-Semite Jew hater. And so this is not the time. I mean, America, they're going to have to go it alone. And it's interesting in Scripture how it says that Israel does have, go it alone, that yeah. all nations will yes. be against them. All nations. 
And so that's why they can't depend on us. They have to st depend on the strong right arm of a holy God, and he will be for there for them. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. So we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I stood um, right by the CBN uh, where they were broadcasting and TBN. I stood right by it last night, and we prayed for the peace of Jerusalem overlooking the Mount of Olives. It's a beautiful, beautiful scene, and I have full confidence that that God is going to have this for them, but they're going to have to look to him. Well, that's what it says in Ezekiel 38, 39. It says that every nation doesn't get involved, um, but that God delivers them in, in that incredible war of Gog and Magog. Remember, Putin, um, Iran's leader, and Turkey's leader, Erdogan, all met together a week to 10 days ago. This never happened before in yeah. history. Yeah, and there they were, the three major players of Gog and Magog, standing side by side, mm -hmm. all holding hands. I mean, that, that was leaping right out of the pages of the Bible. Remember, in 1982, Israel took out a rocks nuclear reactor, one. And only one person died on the ground. I believe that was 82. 40 years later, the scenario is Iran with nuclear reactors all throughout, the, some of them and underground, hidden, hidden uh, under, underground under mountains. In, within mountains. So very, very difficult, totally different than what happened in 1982. Uh, but if anybody can do it, Israel can do it. The sad part is she'll do the world a favor and she'll be condemned for having done the world a favor. If she does this, mm -hmm. we don't know that she will. Um, but we do know Gog Magog is on the horizon. Ladies, let's jump to some questions here really quick. How do I respond to people who say my faith should not impact politics? <laughs> I think you know my opinion. I would say it's, it's schizophrenic if what you believe doesn't impact that part of your life. I mean, if you choose not to be political, that's up to you. That's no problem. But what a weird thing. I mean, where's our faith then? I mean, our faith should be in every aspect of our life, in our family, our relationship, our finances. It should show up everywhere and in how we do politics. So, I mean, to me, that it's, it's bizarre. It's a bizarre thing to, to think that, that your faith wouldn't impact. Because, I, because atheist faith impacts their voting. Absolutely, it does. You know, Muslims yeah. impact. Oh, yeah. Everybody's faith impacts. Why, does, why is it just Christians that have to stay home? So. Um, folks are asking about about food insecurity. Mark, I just think, and I know we're running short on time, we need to run one clip on perhaps the coming famine and then just address it momentarily about how folks can prepare for what might be coming, the food shortages, et cetera, because it could be very, very serious. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's look at this, let's look at this uh, video here. Um, and again, we had a number of them queued up, but Let's just look at one, and this talking about uh, the crisis and how everybody's recognizing it. The potential of it is across the board. It's not like this is some sort of right-wing conspiracy idea. Catch this. It's mealtime in the nation of Yemen, but Ghalib al-Najjar isn't eating so that his children have enough food. He says he and his family live like ants or fish. We eat what we can find. Experts warn that in the months ahead, food is going to be harder to find in many more nations. A perfect storm of several problems is decimating the world food supply. It's being called the biggest food crisis since World War II. An estimated 285 million people face starvation. The head of the World Food Program, former South Carolina Governor David Beasley, says the world food supply already faced a catastrophe before the war in Ukraine. We're so short of funds already, and now with Ukraine, we've, uh, we've got 50% rations for people, for example, in Yemen, Niger, 50% rations, Chad, 50% rations, and 50% don't have anything, those who are in extreme need. In the U.S., Americans have seen food costs rise almost 10 percent over last year, the steepest increase in 40 years. And experts predict it will lead to an increase in malnutrition among America's poor. In the developing world, however, it's become a matter of life and death. 
Russia and Ukraine together produce almost one third of the world's wheat. But Ukrainian farmers have been sidelined by the war, and Russia has banned exports. They, they've got to be planting again and harvesting again. If, if they don't, then you're going to have a global supply problem. And the war in Ukraine is only the latest of many problems to hit the world food supply. Food prices were already high from soaring inflation and fuel costs. Fertilizer prices are now 40 percent higher than a month ago before the invasion of Ukraine, which along with high fuel prices makes it too expensive for some farmers to plant crops this year. We've never seen these type of increases in fertilizer. You're talking three, four hundred percent increases in a 14 month period. Add to that a drought that damaged this spring's U.S. winter wheat harvest. OK, so it's a perfect storm that's come together for today. Legitimate question here is, is how do we kind of prepare? I mean, that's probably a, you know, an hour long message, but, but, but short version, how do we prepare for what might be coming, uh, which is just plain a shortage of or empty shelves? Well, you know, Jan, as you and I have talked many times on this, this particular subject, friends, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you got to remember this, we never put our trust in the uncertainty of riches or our provisions. Number one, our trust is always in the living God. And then secondly, we need to apply the principles of Proverbs. There's over 2,000 verses in the Bible on money. Everyone thinks they're all about giving to the church. That's not true. There's a, a, it's about managing resources. And if you read through the book of Proverbs, it says a wise man sees danger and turns away from it. A wise man has a plan and has an advantage. A wise man gathers during the time of opportunity, during the harvest time, for the lean times. And there's Bible stories everywhere in the Old Testament as well as places in the New Testament about how God's people endured difficult times mm -hmm. and God provided for them and how they planned at different times. You remember Joseph and the famine that came to Egypt? He saved his family and the whole world because God gave him wisdom and insight in that moment. Friends, God's going to take care of us, but you need to use this time as wisely as possible. And people always say, well, uh, what do I do? And, and I just want you to know all of us, our net worth is different. Your opportunities are different. I was talking to a person the other day in Idaho, lives on uh, uh, 70 acres, has 70 trees. In fact, they're they're, they're having a streaming party right now. And his, his situation is different. I live in a condo. So it's completely a different scenario. Everyone's going to have to go to the Lord, fasting and prayer, look to the scriptures, get God's wisdom, build the best plan you possibly can so that you can meet your own needs and have something to share in the midst of the crisis for the glory of God. Ladies, I have a question for you, and then, uh, then we're going to be wrapping things up. Amen. I agree with that. Can I just say yes, one thing? Yes, please. In response to the question before about your faith and politics, yeah. all I want to say is there is an election. There's, a pr there's primaries right now, and this November there's an election. W what you saw in that clip is the incompetence of politicians and the fecklessness of politicians. A lot of what is happening is politician-made foibles that is going to see a lot of people get killed because of what these decisions are making. Put faith to action and vote. Vote for people who aren't going to keep this up. This is, this is cruel. This is cruel. And make sure that you vote and get other people out to vote. And I agree with everything that you said. Would it, everybody has to know before the Lord what to do, but prepare. Yeah. We have to be wise and store up you know, what we think we need to. And I would say vote. And I would say some of us need to get up and get involved and take school boards back yeah, that's right. and city councils back and, and so forth. And you say, oh, we can't do that, Mark. That, that's not Christian. Friends, understand if you're living under a dictatorship, Christians submit to that and they are persecuted. About 300,000 martyrs this last year. But if you have the stewardship and opportunity to influence government, because in America, you own the government, the government doesn't own you. At least that's how the Constitution's written. And so, therefore, if you circumvent or you ignore the stewardship, there's consequences. So seize the moment for Jesus. Well, give these ladies a hand. Would you do that?
ladies, thank you for your zeal and love and devotion to the Lord, and you've ministered to us tonight. I want to leave you with the verse tonight. And the reason is, is you can look at all this and be scared to death. And you should not be scared to death. Why? Because our God is in the heavens, and he does whatever he pleases. It's God who raises up kings and removes kings. Yes, vote, get involved, but just know that God has a bigger plan, and sometimes it's hard for us to see. Daniel found that out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found that out. Joseph found that out in Egypt. And on and on I could go with the illustrations of that. But I want you to hold on to this verse because if you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, listen to these words. The Apostle Paul is thrown in prison. Why is he in prison? Because he's done something evil? No. He's only done good things. And Nero's gone around and burned Rome. He's going to burn Rome. He's going to blame it on who? Christians. And the persecution will rise. Well, he's in prison right now, and he's writing these, this, this final message to Timothy. I mean, he's been abandoned. He stood before the authorities alone. He says, only the Lord stood with me. All my Christian friends took off. And then he concludes with these words, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Friends, in the reality, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've got to hold on to that verse. Otherwise, you will lose your mind watching the insanity unfold. Let me, just, let me just pull you back to those two thoughts. First one is this, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. Who is our rescuer? God is our rescuer. And if you think the government is your rescuer, you're going to be really disappointed. If you think your pastor is going to be your rescuer, I got news for you. You're going to be disappointed. But the chief shepherd, the living Christ, he is our rescuer. What will he rescue us from? From every evil deed. Whether it comes from Europe or Washington or St. Paul or from your local city. I'm just every evil deed. He will rescue us. Man, hold on to that promise. The apostle Paul did when he was in prison. Second truth there, the Lord will bring us safely to his heavenly kingdom. You're going to get there safe. Friends, they may kill the body. Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. Fear him who is able to kill the body and the, and the soul. You fear the living God. Listen, the fear of the Lord suppresses the fear of men. Read the book of Proverbs. It says the fear of man is a snare. But when we fear the living God, God gives us wisdom. God gives us understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And yet our world, forsaking God, they profess to be wise, but they are absolute fools. The Lord, if you trusted Jesus Christ, he's going to rescue you from every evil deed. And he is the one that's going to deliver you safely to his heavenly kingdom. And you know, there's a, re a response to that. And the response is in those last words the Lord's going to be glorified. He should be glorified today. Lord, I'm holding on to your promise. This is going to, you're going to rescue me and you're going to deliver me safely and I bless you today. It says, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. It should give us peace. We should glorify him today. We should glorify him tomorrow. And friends, when you get to that heavenly kingdom and you can look back and you can see how he's rescued you along the way, how he's brought you safely to his heavenly kingdom, you're going to be the one standing up and shouting, glory to God in the highest. That's the response. That's the response. Now you could say, you might ask the question, maybe you ask two questions. Will the Lord rescue me? Maybe he's going to rescue Jan or Michelle or someone else, but will he rescue me? And it comes down to one, one thing, my friend. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ alone to pay for your sin? You see, the reality is, is that all of us are sinning. It doesn't matter your skin tone. This, this, this propaganda of Christian nationalism, I've risked my life. I've nearly been killed in Muslim villages going there to tell them about Jesus. Why? Because he's the only way. I, I, my children and, and my wife have been exposed to all sorts of various diseases, way more dangerous than COVID for the sake of the gospel. We've rescued We've helped rescue thousands and thousands of children that have a different skin tone, color than us. Why? Because Jesus died on a cross so that they might have everlasting life. 
Listen, Jesus died on a cross so that you might have everlasting life. If you want to be rescued, you got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to be safely delivered to his heavenly kingdom, you've got to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can do it tonight. Don't put it off. I remember one time sharing this with a man. We were fishing on the side of a lake. And he said, Mark, you know, I just don't have time to do that. And I said, how about right now? And so my question to you, how about right now? And you know what? He trusted Christ right then. And the Lord came into his life. He received the Holy Spirit. God worked in his life. He became a great leader in our church. I love him today. In fact, his family's probably watching right now. Listen, friends, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to trust him. What does it mean to trust in Christ? It includes three things, knowledge, mental assent, and then a moment where you personally trust Christ. The knowledge, what knowledge? The knowledge that I'm sinful. It doesn't matter my language. It doesn't matter my passport or the country I'm from or who my grandparents are or how many times I've gone to church. I am sinful and I need a Savior. And the Savior is the provision of God, the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world, the one who would come from heaven, take upon human form, die on that cross, pay for sin. How do we know that Jesus is the Son of God? He rose the third day. That's how we know. And so you got to have that knowledge and that he has paid it all so that you and I might have everlasting life. Secondly, we got to give mental assent to that. It's not enough to have the knowledge. Oh, yeah, I know that there's a Jesus and there's a cross and there's a tomb. But yes, there's a real cross. There's a real tomb. There really is a Savior. He really is seated at the right hand of God. He really does give salvation to all those who believe in him. But there's a third element, and that's when you say, I trust him personally to pay for my sins and make me acceptable to God. This is really important. You see, a lot of people know about Jesus. A lot of people have given mental assent to Jesus. But the question is, has there been a point in time in your life where you said, I trust Jesus right now and him alone to rescue me, to save me, to deliver me safely to his heavenly kingdom, to make me acceptable to God, to wash away my sins? Have you done that, my friends? Those of you watching online, have you trusted in Jesus? Today is the moment. Today is the time. You know, when you talk about Jesus dying, that's called history. When you talk about Jesus dying for sins, that's theology. When you talk about Jesus dying for my sins, now you have salvation. So I just want to invite you right now to call upon the name of the Lord, to put your trust in Jesus Christ. Wherever you're at, wherever you're watching, maybe you're in a, for a, a country now, other side of the world, right now is going to pray. I'm going to ask you to join me, to call upon the name of the Lord, to, to right now consciously say, I trust Jesus and him alone as my Savior. Would you pray with me? Lord, we humble ourselves in your presence. And God, I pray that you would draw us to Jesus. Friends, call upon his name right now. Jesus, you died on the cross. I know that. And I believe that you died for sins and you rose again the third day. You are the Son of God. And right now, the best I know how, Jesus, I trust you alone to pay for my sins, to make me acceptable to God. Chodana ye ko pedi